In class, you may have heard about CPAP, PEEP, BiPAP, but you're not really clear on it. You don't have it down pat yet. Let me bring this down for you simply. First, we have CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Just like the name sounds, we're providing positive pressure, pushing it down deep into the lungs. Why are we doing that? There's two main reasons, but it has to do with mainly the alveoli, keeping the alveoli open and then clearing anything out of the lungs that shouldn't be there. That's the role of CPAP. Remember, the alveoli is where gas exchange occurs. That's where oxygen is going in, carbon dioxide is going out. If we have an issue with that, well, what happens? Well, our SpO2 drops and the patient gets really sick. So CPAP is gonna allow the clearing of the alveoli. So now we have a nice pad in order to actually have gas exchange occur in and out. And then we're gonna keep it open. But here, the keep it open part, what is that gonna do with? PEEP. So PEEP is a value that we measure, okay? PEEP stands for positive and expiratory pressure. Okay, so what does that mean? PEEP is used in both CPAP and BiPAP. It's also a setting that you can play with on the ventilator as well. But what PEEP is, is when your patient is on CPAP or BiPAP and they exhale, right? That PEEP setting that you have set up, the PEEP value, that is the alveoli still having pressure when you exhale. So if I exhale out normally, and let's say my PEEP, I've totally exhaled, and my, my, my basically the pressure in my lungs is zero. I exhaled everything, right? PEEP would be zero, right? So instead of having nothing, I keep some positive pressure on exhalation in my lungs. And in this case, deep into the lungs, into the alveoli. So the alveoli can stay open because we're having an issue right now with our alveoli, either with junk and pus like an ammonia or fluid like heart failure, right? An issue like that where we wanna keep it open so we can have better gas exchange. See where I'm going with this? Now, what is the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? Well, I'm gonna go over the indications and contraindications in a minute for like when we use CPAP in the ambulance. But the biggest difference between CPAP and BiPAP is CPAP. You may have heard that there's a lot of anxiety with CPAP, right? We have to coach our patient when we're putting the mask on them. It's, it's a lot of pressure going down the lungs. They're breathing in a totally different way with positive pressure, right? It's a lot. Why is it so, why is it so anxious? Why, why? Here's why. Not only is the pressure great going down to the lungs and it feels kind of awkward, but it's hard to exhale against that great pressure. See, with CPAP, we're just forcing air in. With BiPAP, we're gonna force that positive in, and then guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna lower the pressure so it's easier to exhale. The only con of CPAP is it can be hard to exhale against the continuous positive airway pressure. It's continuous. So it's hard to exhale against it. Or BiPAP, the bi level, we, we're gonna push in and then we can lower it, let them exhale, bring it up again, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down the pressure so it's easier to exhale, which is why in a hospital, if someone's, for example, they're in an ICU, they're on a medical floor, they're in the ER for hours, they're probably gonna be on BiPAP versus CPAP because it's a little more comfortable for the patient. Makes sense? Okay, let's go over situations where we're actually gonna use CPAP in the ambulance and indications and contraindications. Now, here are four main indications for using CPAP. Asthma, COPD, CHF, and pneumonia. Remember, big thing with CPAP, we're keeping the alveoli open and we're clearing anything out of the lungs that doesn't belong there. That's the idea and the visual 
I want you to have in your head. This way you'll never forget it the rest of your career, right? So we can see CHF, fluid, blood, get it out. Pneumonia, fluid, infection, junk in the lungs, pus, get it out. Keep the alveoli open. All these things are gonna mess with our gas exchange. So that's why we are using CPAP, that positive pressure to keep the alveoli open so oxygen can flood in and carbon dioxide get out, right? Now here's a mnemonic that I use with my students. It's called RR Owl. It's called the Pirate Owl Mnemonic. So this is one of the best mnemonics I've ever seen really for respiratory patients. And with this mnemonic, I can get a clear picture of how sick my patient is as far as their respiratory status. So I've basically drawn out here a, a, a visual, if you will, of a patient that would require CPAP. Now, on a, at an EMT level or an EMR level, of course, you know, first thing we would do is we would trial out a nano breather on this particular patient. And then our next line would be to go to CPAP, right? Or if you have a question where the nano breather fails, then we would go, okay, now it's time for CPAP. Just want to get that little, little visual in your head. So respiratory rate is 28, that's too high. O is what is the O2 sat? In this case, it's 90%. Words per sentence, one to two word sentences. And then look out for signs of labored breathing, like for example, accessory muscle use, the positioning of the patient, they're bent over, they're trying to, they're, they're positioning themselves so they try to get air in, they're bringing their, their, their head up, they're in, a tri, they're in a tripod position, right? These are things we want to look at. So this particular patient, this patient, is gonna be an indication for CPAP. And then, we, then what, let's just say, for example, for these uh, signs and symptoms, asthma can have wheezing, COPD can have wheezing, pneumonia can have, can have rails or ronchi, CHF has whales, has rails, also known as uh, crackles, right? Rails. So these are the things we, we want to look at, and these are our indications for CPAP. Now, here are the contraindications when we will not be using CPAP on our patients. And in this case, if we think about it, if the oxygen devices have failed, like nasal cannula and out of breather, we, have, we can't use CPAP. This is someone who we're gonna to have to start to control and manage their airway for them. In most cases, this is what we're looking at. So contraindication is well, we can't use CPAP, which means we we'll probably have to go in and manage their airway, is first, they can't obey commands. So they're not able to follow basic commands. There's some coaching when putting on, putting, actually putting the CPAP mask on the patient, and it can be a little frightening for the patient. You have to be able to coach them. You have to be able to obey commands. If they're altered mental status or confused, and or they have a, basically a low GCS, maybe they're only responsive to voice or papal stimuli, that's not good, right? They're probably not gonna be able to obey commands on GCS, which causes them to be confused and altered, right? So that they get, CPAP won't work with that in that case. Now, here's an interesting one. CPAP, one of the things the adverse effects is hypotensive, getting into hypotension, right? So we want to caution using CPAP in hypotension, in hypotensive patients. Now, why is that? Here's why. CPAP is going to take pressure off of the vena cava and decrease the preload coming back to the heart. Preload is blood returning back to the heart. So that's what CPAP is going to do due to this positive pressure coming into the chest and to the lungs, right? Now, that's why I'm saying caution in hypotensive patients because less well, blood return drops your blood pressure, right? So keep that in mind. Now, what if someone's actively vomiting? Well, if they're actively vomiting and you have a mask strapped down to their face with pressure coming in, you're going to cause aspiration. So we want to use something like Zofran, it could be IV, right? And we want to stop the vomiting from occurring. Then we can move forward with our CPAP. So treat the vomiting first, get them to stop vomiting, and then we can move forward with CPAP, right? And finally, this is a key point. We are not going to give CPAP to somebody with a pneumothorax. Okay, this is huge. Big red flag. Do not do that. But also, I want you to think of CPAP when you're using it like any other respiratory patient 
or any intubated or airway patient. We're always going to continue to reassess our vitals and our lung sounds. This is very, very important. So we, we're putting a ton of pressure down to the lungs. We don't want to inadvertently cause a pneumothorax while using CPAP because the pressure is so great. So constantly check your lung sounds to make sure that we don't have a pneumothorax occurring and your vitals and assessments and so on and so on. Now, finally, here's my final notes. Sit them upright. Our initial dose is gonna be, could be five to start off with. 10 is a fine dose to start off with. So I have five to 10 starting off treatment. Remember, do your cardiac monitoring. Get a 12 week EKG, monitor your SpO2. You can, of course, do end tidal CO2 with CPAP. And then lung sounds, lung sounds, lung sounds. Keep reassessing those lung sounds. And then we could trend this throughout the scene time and throughout transport until we get to hospital. Now, a lot of you asked in the comments about how to prepare for school, how to get through school, and how to pass NREMT. The first link in the description is a study tool that I give to all my students to accomplish all of that. It's called the Video Vault. Inside the Video Vault is over 480 videos of content, audio files, worksheets, practice quizzes, our community group. What I do in the Video Vault is take all the concepts you need to know to pass school at NREMT and I break them down simply for you. So that way you just follow along with the videos, you follow the study plan and you pass. I give my students lifetime access in the first link in the description and I'll see you on the inside.